let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. Our need in the 21st century to go back and allow ourselves to feel the shock of Paul's emphasis on divine kinship. Because what we take for granted, you know, God is Father, Christ is Son, we're brothers and sisters, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. This wasn't stuff that was taken for granted. This is what Jesus introduced, and it represents something of a revolution in the history of world religions. As we discover in the first sermon recorded in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus do? He calls God Father 17 times, which is more in one sermon than you will find in the entire Hebrew Bible. There are 11 references to God as a father, and it never reaches beyond the merely metaphorical for the most part in the Hebrew Bible. But Jesus introduces God as Father 17 times in one sermon, his first sermon. And over 170 times does he call God Father in the four Gospels. And Paul refers to God as Father more than 40 times in his epistles, but more in this little epistle to the Ephesians than in any other letter, including the ones that are like twice as long, like Romans and 1 Corinthians. At the same time, we notice the profusion, the unprecedented frequency and force of divine fatherhood and sonship in the New Testament. I also want to highlight a rather unexpected absence. Because in the Old Testament, the language of covenant, the terminology of covenant, is used with great, great frequency. 325 occurrences of berit in the, old, in the Hebrew Bible. 325 times you have references to the covenant, the covenant promise, the covenant oath, the covenant curse, the covenant blessing. And in the entire New Testament, how many occurrences of the word covenant do you find? 33. 17 of which are found in the book of Hebrews because it was written to Hebrews who thought in covenantal terms. The other 26 books of the New Testament, you find the word covenant only what? 16 times. Why does the language of covenant seemingly drop out of the new covenant? Some scholars say because it wasn't really important anymore. Others say because you didn't have to assert that which everybody assumes. But when you look at Second Temple Jewish literature, when you study the material that was circulated among Jews around this time, the language of covenant is more frequently used than it is by Paul, much. Now, why is that? Why does the language of covenant seemingly decrease and the language of kinship increases? It's not because of how the covenant was forgotten. Rather, it's because of the way the covenant was fulfilled. In the Old Testament, the fact that God is establishing a covenant with us makes us his family. But his family in a horizontal sense, not strictly vertical. Why? Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That makes us his sheepfold. We are his pasture. No, we graze, he feeds us and protects us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We're all like sheep. Or we also hear the language that the Lord is the God of our fathers. But he's not our God and our Father. He's the God of our fathers. The Lord is my shepherd. But as Pope Benedict has pointed out frequently in his writings for the last 30 or 40 years, when the shepherd became the Lamb of God, when the God of our fathers sent his only beloved Son so that the Son of God becomes the Son of Man, so that sons and daughters of men can become sons and daughters of God, then all of a sudden you see that the covenant that the Israelites had pinned all their hopes to is fulfilled in a way that exceeds their highest hopes, their wildest dreams. God has made a covenant with us 
going back to creation with Adam, renewing it through Noah, and then Abraham, Moses, and then David. And that's the final installment in the covenant in the Old Testament, this royal family. And yet when the kingdom is demolished and when the monarchy is absent, you wonder what's going on. The Old Testament finishes off like a story in search of an ending. And when Christ comes to fulfill it, the fulfillment of the Old Covenant, again, goes beyond the most devout and fervent expectations of the faithful Jews. Because now, communion, now kinship solidarity, now family bonds aren't just being maintained by God in this human family of Abraham. Now we've entered into a covenant bond a family solidarity with God who has now revealed himself as Father. God who has revealed himself through the Son. And together they confer the spirit of sonship upon Jews and Greeks in a way that goes beyond what the Jews themselves were expecting. And so what we've got to do as we ponder this epistle, as we prayerfully study Ephesians, is to ask the Holy Spirit to help us Find our first love, that love that came to me when I was first converted, that love that came to me when I was first fathering a newborn son, the first of our six, thereby discovering how much God loves me in a way that exceeded anything I ever knew. So I want to just propose to you that you are here, not just as sons and daughters of your natural parents, but we are more truly to identify ourselves as sons and daughters of the Most High. And thereby understand that what Paul is teaching here should have a shock value for us like it did for them. That it should not just shock us, but it should be a delight to us to find again a first love that maybe fades from time to time. And as we do, I am sure that God our Father is going to renew the spirit of sonship within us through our study. Thank you.